Hello and welcome to the Healing Element Podcast, a weekly discussion giving you the tools to understand and heal from intergenerational trauma. I am your host, Kai Marie. To find out more information about the topics discussed today, visit kaimarie.com. Hello, and thank you, everyone who is joining us today. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, so (laughs) we're going to be um, doing this session on Zoom, uh, and then it will be posted to Facebook. So in case you missed the session, you can always look back and take a look. So I'm really excited. My name is Kai Marie Torrance. Um, I am the creator and host of the Healing Element podcast. And I'm really excited. The launch of the podcast is officially in April, but I'm doing a few Facebook Live conversations before uh, the actual launch of the podcast. And this is one of the conversations that we're having today. And I am very excited to have a very special guest, Chevelle Mavens. Um, She's here in the Charlotte area, and she's going to be um, talking about psychological noise. Um, This is based on the article that she wrote, and I thought it was very much so on point. And it kind of made sense of what I go through um, and probably what a lot of people um, who are classified as as Black in this country that they go through on a daily basis. So before we jump into it, I just want to, and I'm going to look down because I just want to read a little bit of Chevelle's bio, very (laughs) impressive bio. Um, So she is the founder and CEO of Addiction Prevention, where she provides training on substance abuse, mental health, and wellness. She also worked as a social worker in adult services for the Department of Social Services, where she investigates cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Lemoyne College and attended Syracuse University's dual graduate program in rehabilitation counseling and school counseling, and she earned her master's in counseling with the specialization in addiction and mental health disorders from Capella University. So we have a perfect person today (laughs) to go over this with us. And so now um, Chevelle resides in the North Carolina area with her family. So very excited to have her uh, today to talk about psychological noise. And so we're talking about not only psychological noise, but as it relates to historical trauma. So this is very Mm -hmm. much so specifically towards um, the black community here in the US. Um, And so as we go into it, we did our introductions. Um, So Chevelle, before we jump into your article, can you Mm -hmm. kind of explain a little bit what is psychological noise? And again, thank you for joining today. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, Yeah, so when, this is interesting, the psychological noise, Ash was talking to my son, which is 18. He was taking a communication class. Um, and he knows that I like to write articles to try to give my point of view, to educate people, but also to validate what people are experiencing today. Mm-hmm. So we were talking about psychological noise. Um, so psychological noise is a type of interference that occur in our mind um, as we try to communicate every day with other people. So it's like when you're about to... Um, walk into the store, you're thinking about, I don't know if something just popped up on my computer, you're thinking about, um, um, you know, what you're going to get. It's it's, it's not a voice, but it's almost like your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, And and depending on your experience, it can cause an interference. Um, And I think we're going to go in more detail, but basically is is an interference that occur within our minds that can, it can either help your experience or it can not help your experience. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, it's so uh, when you said that um, as far as the, the pieces that you do write, it's kind of like this is what I experienced and also helps other right. people to say like, oh, wow, so I'm not the only, like I'm not alone in this. I'm not the right. only person that's going through this. And so when right. I read your article, that's what I felt. It was like, so this is a thing that I go, that I experience, and that other people um, within my community, as we had talked before, like people that mm-hmm. have that shared experience, you right. can relate to, okay, so I don't feel so isolated. Other people also go through this um, right. with similar history as I have right. in our community. Right. Um, yes. So, and so with saying that, 
um, in addition to kind of sharing your own experience, did you, was there anything in like in the news cycle or anything else that you saw that you're like, it's time for this piece to kind of come out? Um, it's like, what haven't happened in the right. news? <laughs> you know? I mean, True. you know, I can tell you, um, I've lived down here for almost six years. So I'm from upstate New York, Syracuse, and then I moved down here with my family. Um, and it took some adjustment because, you know, um, there, you know, being a black person in America, we know that we experience racism all the time. Right. Um, I, I've learned, you know, in the South, they're more verbal about it. <laughs> um, and then with, with our current political climate, um, with our administration, you really not only see it, feel it, you hear it. Right. Um, and, and I said, you know what? You know, and I and I meant to write this article for Black History Month, but I said, you know what, this is something we experience every day. This is not just in February. This is <laughs> um, January through December. Right. So I, I said, you know, let me put something out there and see what other people think. Um, and, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think that's important because a lot of times we really, we meaning um, black the Black community, we really talk about our experience like during Black History Month. And then right. it'll go silent after that. So I think that it's awesome that you decided to like, no, we're going to expand the conversation because this is what we go through, not just in the month of February. <laughs> this is something that we go through and experience every single day of our lives. Right. And so when I read your article, um, as I said, like it really spoke to me because it was like, okay, there's, there's like a name to this thing. Because um, mm -hmm. sometimes it can feel like my own insecurity. And to give an example, and who and anybody has not read the article yet, I will again post it um, in the event for uh, this Facebook Live discussion. And also I will include in the newsletter that goes out, if you're signed up for the Journey to Healing newsletter, I will also include the article in that as well. And uh, when you were talking about like that yoga piece, and mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that really spoke to me because I, you know, obviously I'm a yoga teacher. I've attended many yoga classes and, mm -hmm many times when I go into those spaces where I already know I'm going to be the only black person, mm -hmm. I already have this in my head of like this defense that goes up um, because of experiences that I've had where people have made comments like about my mat. Um, like, well, wh why do you have that kind of mat? And I'm just like, right. Like what kind of question is it? <laughs> right? <laughs> and why are you concerned about it? Um, right. Or just the, you can sense when people are uncomfortable with your presence. It right. always doesn't have to be like a, something that's verbalized, mm -hmm. like a movement. It's just energetically you can feel the moving away. Um, and so when also when I go, a lot of times I go with my fiance Duane, and so I'm also there's also that I have that concern with him um, mm -hmm. because we're going to be honest here. Uh, many of the people that attend yoga classes are white women. And we have been in situations where we've gone into a yoga class and I've seen a woman when Duane ba ba walks by clutch her purse and I see his reaction and it is frustrating because he's there to release stress and relax and the exact opposite is happening in our body. Right. Right. So no. you know, any thoughts on like that type of experience of. Yeah. And I think we all experience it to a certain degree every day. You know, I, I, can tell you, you know, I was, before this, I was talking to my husband and I said, you know, one day, you know, I was going to the gym and I'm crossing the street. It was, it was a red light. There was a car there waiting. And as I walk past the car, I hear click, click. I look back, the lady looked like she was fearing for her life. And I said, oh my God, I'm coming from work. I'm on my lunch break, I'm trying to do a Pilates class, and you're concerned, yeah. you're scared of me, like, what did I do in that moment, I had a, you know, a pink gym bag, you know, right. in my head going to Pilates, right. what, what was it about me, you know, and I, and then we could say, you know what, Chevelle, maybe she just, you know, was going to lock her door, it, it wasn't mm -hmm. you, but then I, you can think of other situations that occur, and right. it's not just, it's not just with me, you can go to any state, any mm -hmm. city in the United States and talk to different black people from different social backgrounds and they will tell you the same experience. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, so it's not me, but this right. is what I feel internally. Right. Um, and how do I deal with that on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. It's very true. And uh, this reminds me of another situation that occurred and this like really jarred me. Mm -hmm. um and it was when uh this is when i lived in connecticut 
um, mm-hmm. in, I think we were living in Bridgeport at the time. Um, now I'm in North Carolina, in Charlotte, North Carolina. But at that point in um, Connecticut, living in Bridgeport, um, at that point, uh, Dwayne and I w- worked in New York City and commuted back and forth from Connecticut mm-hmm. to New York City. The train that we took was out of the Fairfield train station. Now, Fairfield is a relatively affluent neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I just want to kind of make that so that way it puts everything kind of in context. Right. So one, it was one late night. We got back um, from New York City. We went to our car. The car wouldn't start. So we were having trouble with the car. And so we're like, <laughs> we're going to ride this car until it like shuts down. And it right. literally started to do that. <laughs> Right. So we got in the car. It didn't, it didn't start. So we're just like, okay, here we go. We have to like, you know, Dwayne has to do something because I am of no help. So mm-hmm. he gets out um, to look under the hood. And I was like, oh, I want to help. And he's like, do you know how to start the car? And I was like, I do not. He's like, then I don't really know how you can help me. I was like, well, I'll hold the flashlight. So I have my right. phone out there with the flashlight. And so we're there. He's, you know, doing whatever he's doing to try to get the um, battery um, to start, to start Mm -hmm. the car. And maybe like a few feet from us, because we were in a parking lot where everyone parked when they were taking the train. Um, And right behind us was like a road where you could drive through the lot. And -hmm. a police officer pulled up, um, you know, still several feet away from us. And Mm -hmm. he just flashed his the light, I don't know, from uh, a flashlight that he had in his car just flashed it on us. And so I turned around and he's like, is everything okay over there? So I was like, what in the world? So I slowly turned around and I saw it was a police officer and I was like, I said, yes, everything's fine. And he didn't respond. He just kept the light on us. And so this was during a period, which I know this is not a very good marker of time because we constantly see this in social media, but this was Mm -hmm. a period where there was just like so much, so many images of black men and black women getting either bullied, beat, or killed by police. So I already had that kind of like in my memory bank Mm -hmm. and it raised my anxiety immediately. So I turned to Dwayne, I was like, Dwayne, there's a police officer there. And he's just shining the light on us. And I just said that everything's fine, but he's not responding. So the Dwayne's right. like, don't worry about it. Um, oh, yeah, Tariq joining. Uh, he's like, you know, don't worry about it. Um, we'll, uh, you know, just keep the light flashed on us. And, you know, that's it. So I was like, oh, okay. Right. So I, you know, he continues. So the officer is still there. So she, at this point, my, I'm like, yo, is he calling for backup? Like, why mm-hmm. is, why is So that's that psychological noise in yeah. your head. So I'm like, mm-hmm. is he calling for backup? And Dwayne's like, just don't make a, a sudden move. So I was like, okay, right. no, like, our, it's just our car. Right. And we're literally like, what do we have to do to survive this? Right. I'm not exaggerating. So the cop finally says, I said, is everything okay over there? Still the light flashing. So I, I was like, Dwayne, don't move. Because now I'm afraid if he move, if he suddenly right. makes a sudden move, it's night, right. what is going to happen? So I turned and I was like, officer, we're good. Car trouble. He, do, he still doesn't respond. So at this point, I literally, I'm, I feel myself starting to shake. Right. I'm like, I don't, I don't know why he's sitting in the car. I don't know why this bright light is flashing on us. And I don't know right. what he's, what he's thinking. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So Chevelle's like, uh, Chevelle, or so, <laughs> um, so Dwayne's like, okay, you know, don't worry about it. Like, I'm just going to stay calm. I'm not going to move. Right. Mm-hmm. So the officer once again yells from the car. I said, is everything good? So Dwayne's like, I'm going to move slowly. Kai, you don't move. So I was like, okay. I'm not going to move. At this point, I'm in like almost tears because I'm like, I don't want Dwayne to move because what if he, again, the sudden move, I'm thinking about the images that I've seen on the news, on social media. And it's very real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, so Dwayne turns and he says, officer, I, I'm almost out of here. We just had to get our car started. So mm-hmm. he, the officer, he has never responded to us. He just shouts from his car with this, bright <laughs> light flashed over right us. right so Dwayne turns around and he's like Kai just stay with me under the hood don't move we're just mm-hmm. gonna... and we were d- he, whatever he had to do we were done we were literally just under the hood like this 
right. not knowing what to do next. Because right. we're like, if it's a fast movement, what is he going to think? Because it's dark, he can say he can't see or what have you. Right. So um, finally, the cop drove away. After I, I saw that, I was like, okay, doing the cop has left. He's like, okay, mm-hmm. he's like, just really slowly move and we're going to get into the car. Mm-hmm. We slowly move. I'm like, okay. I'm walking around like the, the cop's gone. I still got hands up. <laughs> I'm like, right, hands up, right. walk into the car. I get in the car. I am shaking. Dwayne is angry. Mm-hmm. He's like, he's just like, we just got out, got just left work. The car wouldn't stop. And we literally have a cop yelling from a car at us. So right. after that happened, I was jarred. Like I would t- anytime a cop rode past me, I would immediately go into, I would freeze. Right. And it got to the point where Dwayne's like, you know, you really ha- like, you have to be able to function. And I was like, mm-hmm. I, that story could have ended any kind of way. Right. It could have mm-hmm. ended with, I thought they were going to lurch at me. There were two people, two shadows. I couldn't really tell. So all of that's playing in my head every time right. I see a police officer is like right. when we talk about there's good police officers and bad police officers, which I believe, but yes, I'm totally police officer, I'm going to have an interaction with. Right. Right. Um, so just when you talk about the psychological noise, it brought me back to that. And it took me a while to like be comfortable. If a police was behind me, I would automatically think they're probably going to pull me over. If they pull me over, this is what from that interaction and also like when we would go to certain areas especially in that connecticut um area you would go to more affluent areas we would always get followed and we right. you could tell that they were looking at our um license plate to do some tracking and uh-huh. it's like the feeling of you not people not wanting you there um right. and then um just not feeling safe and then when you don't feel safe it's like so if something god forbid something does happen to us like should i even call the cops Right, like, right. It, like if some say, God forbid, we had an intruder and I'm there with Dwayne, who's to say how that could go down? Right, right. Again, with that psychological noise. Right. And then, you know, which I will talk about more next month in my next article is mm-hmm. those feelings. That's that paranoia, feeling yeah. anxious, you know, and it can even be depression. But um, it's, it's scary when you don't have any control and you didn't do anything wrong. Right. You know, and I think a lot of us can share stories like that, that occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you start having this interference that affects your life, you know, and it's how do you navigate? Because that narrative is almost that the narrative have already been created for us. Right. Um, and we're just existing in it. Right. Um, and, and that's, and it's scary. It mm-hmm. can be very scary. It is, and um, it's so interesting because uh, there's another uh, therapist that I met here in Charlotte, and it, th- I felt like there was a connection to what you're doing in the psychological noise. She did a series on imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. and she was talking about how, especially like in the Black community, like say if you're a Black woman and you get promoted to a certain mm-hmm. position, and you don't see a lot of people that look like you, mm-hmm. right? And so even though you could have the credentials, there could be this noise, psychological noise of like, did I just get this because I'm black? Like, did they have to check a right. box? Right. And, so and I'm that talk- token black person. Right. And it's like, mm-hmm. instead of you really enjoying and like, I earned this, there can mm-hmm. be that noise in the background. Right. Of, like, well, I don't see anybody else here that looks like me. Right. Um, is this, did, the, did I really get this on my merit or is there something else right. going on because I don't see diversity where, um, with this new position that I now have? Right. That, that, that is, yes. yes. <laughs> no, it, it made me think about, I just thought about that. And cause I was telling her about it because in my experience in the political world, um, mm-hmm. I had worked in politics and I thought, you know, I was like, okay, you know, working in the community. And I noticed how I, a lot of times when there was like the minority events, there I was, <laughs> like, I was right. like all the minority events. So then I was just kind of like, so um, I know I'm qualified, but I see that I'm always going, like, I'm the one that goes to, like, anything that's my, no- it just causes you, you to start to question saying, you know, like, is, is there, is there a deeper reason why I was hired? Right, you right. I mean, and it's just to kind of check a box, fill a gap to say, like, mm-hmm. hired the Black person. Right, right. 
And I think that's something, and I think we're going to talk about that later on, but Mm -hmm. I think that's something we have to work on because we are worthy. You know, we are qualified and Mm -hmm. we do belong. And because how we've been socialized in America, sometimes we ourselves create barriers and don't even realize it from enjoying being in that position. Um, You worked hard and you know, for you to be in a particular position because of biases people have, you did earn that. Yeah. Um, and we and, and that's something that we have to work on um, ourselves, but also work on as a race. Mm-hmm. Very true. And so, as you said, we're going to kind of tie in the historical part of it. And I wanted to bring up an article that was in Upworthy um, that mm-hmm. you and I briefly discussed. And if anybody hasn't seen it, I will also post in the event Good article. Um, description box. And it talks about this young black man who lives in a predominantly white neighborhood. And he talks about his experience of just taking a walk in the neighborhood. And it was so Mm -hmm. interesting. I am paraphrasing a little bit, but at the end, he was just saying like the beauty that was around him, but how he was unable to really enjoy it because he was he was worried about the pace, like how fast he was walking. Was he walking too fast? Was he walking too slow? How was his um, his hands positioned? He can't put his hands in his pocket. Maybe he should have put Mm -hmm. his hands out his pocket because if a police officer walks by, that um, cell phone you know, could be, oh, I thought that was a gun. Like, it's right. all of this noise going on in his head just right. to literally walk down a street. Right. And so I thought that that spoke so much to, was an excellent example of what mm-hmm. you're saying with the psychological noise. What were your mm-hmm. thoughts on on that article? That article, to me, hit the head on the nail because I have two Black sons, and we are the only Black family in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I find myself telling my son, don't wear a hoodie when you go out. You know, if you're cold, wear a jacket. You know, if you were stopped by the police, um, just listen to what they're saying. And if they're asking for ID, let them know it's in your back pocket. I'm reaching in my back pocket. I don't have a weapon. You know, you're prepping your, you know, I'm prepping my kids because I want him to come home. Right. You know, and when you think about it, what other race do that? You know, and I've had this conversation with a young lady I work with. Um, Our kids are the same age. And when her son got his driver's license, um, I said, did you have a conversation with your son? And and this is a white lady. She said, well, you know, wear your seatbelt and, you know, stuff that might be mindful of the mile, you know, how fast you're driving. And I said, any other conversation? And she said, No, she's looking at me like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, my son just got his license. And this is what I, the conversation I had with him, Mm -hmm. you know, you, when you're pulled over and it's not, if you're pulled over is when you get pulled over, because we know that that happens, Mm -hmm. um, how to respond to the officer. I don't care if he disrespects you because I don't want him to see you as being the monster that sometimes is painted about our black men mm-hmm. in our society. I want you, you know, you, I know you're going to be upset, you know, give him, answer his questions and mm-hmm. we'll deal with it once you're home. Right. But, yeah. and, and she just looked at me, she said, really? And I said, yeah, that, that's an experience from a black mom, right. you know? And when I, when my son goes to the mall or he's going to school or he's just going to the corner store, you know, I have the psychological noise in my head of like, what is he going to face? What is he going to deal with? And if my kids can tell you if they're not, if they're going to work and they're not home within a half an hour, I'm texting and calling because I'm worried. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that right there, that's, that's just not healthy. It's right. not healthy. And right. don't tell me there's not one black mom out there. Mm-hmm. that don't experience this mm-hmm. you know this is very common mm-hmm. and yeah. is and is based on what we experience in our in our society right. and how we're viewed right so true and when you said that not being healthy when you think about the depression in our community anxiety yes. um make people suffer from panic attacks and all mental illness you think like these are stressors that we have every single this is like a chronic stress the racism that we de- deal with is right. a chronic stress and right. so to deal with that day in, day out, that does take a toll on the heart. That takes a toll on the brain, just the yes. body to deal with yes. that day in and day out. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, but you're absolutely right. And you got to think about, you know, y- y- there's not a person in this world that don't have stressors. We all have stressors in our life. Mm-hmm. But 
those are things on top of the norm that we have to deal with, which, you know, can probably explain why we have such high rates of African American with high blood pressure. Yeah. Um, we, there is a high rate of depression. We don't talk about it, mm -hmm. you know, um, but when you talk to people, what they're experiencing, you're like, hmm, that sounds like depression or that sounds like anxiety. Mm -hmm. But a lot of time we view, we look at mental health very differently. I think that's changing because we're talking about mental health more, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, now you're seeing more um, actors and actresses talking about what they experience mm -hmm. and that giving people the freedom to say, you know what? Yes, I, I've experienced this. Um, this is what I'm feeling, what I need to do now. Right, right. So true. And I think this is a great segue into talking about that historical part of it um, yeah. as to like how this whole psychological noise that many of us face in our community, where it stems from. And so, Chevelle, can you go into that, that historical Well, piece? one of the things that I wanted to say is that, you know, and I've talked to you before when we talked about doing this, is that mm -hmm. I was even cautious writing the article, putting it up, because I didn't want people like, you're racist, you know, you're, it's like, no, like, let's look at history. Mm -hmm. 1619, that's when this first slave came in Jamestown, right? Mm -hmm. Then we, if we um, go to 1619 to 2020, that's 401 years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that happened within that 401 years. For sure. um, we look at Jim Crow laws, that's from like, um, I think 1877 to the mid-1960s, mm -hmm. how we were treated that um, during that time. And then we look at, you know, we can pull prison to pipeline. We, can, I mean, school, excuse me, school to pipeline, prison pipeline. Um, we can talk about all these things that, what laws has been put in place to, how can I say this, to um, create biases among Black people mm -hmm. um, that happens every single day. Mm -hmm. um, that's that history behind that. And then we look at each time something occurred, when you talk about you being pulled over, uh, or not being pulled over, we were pulled over, my family, with the police, mm -hmm. but when you talk about you and your fiancé with the car, you talk about your... Um, um, experience at yoga. Um, I know that my husband was, you know, we were put over by the police and how he was taken out the car and frisk and it was very embarrassing. It's very scary. But then the officer looked at us and said, you know, wear your seatbelt next time. All of that, that's that, where is that coming from? That's through history, how people are viewing us. Mm -hmm. And those, that could be like microaggressions that lead up to trauma. Mm -hmm. It's not that big event like Rodney King. We we saw that on television, if you remember that. I'm aging myself here. But <laughs> no, I remember. <laughs> I remember that scene on yeah. television, you know, six, seven police officers beating this man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that tr that's traumatizing. Reading that news, seeing that, then you're experiencing that. Right. That affects us as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's how I look at it. If we look at history, just pure numbers don't lie. You know, I can tell you I'm working out 10 hours a day for two weeks and get on the scale and way more. You know, the numbers don't lie, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think if we look at the history on the years and the different laws that put in place, we see that we've been constantly on a, a microaggression way of being oppressed. Right. Um, and, and a lot of time, and I want to say this, a lot of there's some people who do things intentionally to us, mm -hmm. but there's some people that do things that is, is not intentional. It's just because it's just bias that's within the fiber of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes it's hard when it comes to African Americans for people to look and say, maybe I, I, maybe I do need to turn a mirror on myself and look at how I view people or where did my view come from? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is, did, you, did you experience that with that particular person? Because if you did, then you need to look at that particular person. You can't label an entire race. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're fighting with when we look at history and look at how people view us in history. And, right. and it continues with law, with our laws that are being made. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Like when you see uh, the laws coming out that basically... Um, protect us from styling our hair <laughs> like, yes like, uh, the, the ability to style your hair like right why is why are we even having that discussion right right, now? right. Oh, you so, can't you can't there's this young man who is graduated from high school and he has dreads and they want him to cut his hair 
he achieved he earned that why do you care if his hair is dreaded or not why right. why does that really make a difference and over the summer they had something here in um wake county where i live mm -hmm. um that if you have braids or any type of extension in your hair you can't swim in a particular pool why what i mean really yeah. Be that doesn't make any sense and right. you know what that was geared towards i mean there are other races that wear extension they've been doing it for years right but that that it was it was towards us right is that and so when you're talking about that noise like so even as we like say you're getting ready for work or as a as a, um, a woman or a man if you're like oh you know what i think i'm gonna grow my hair out and, and lock it or something right now you're thinking well what i can't lock it because what if now if i lock it i don't get i don't do well they don't they won't like me in the job interview or the, right like again the noise starts to come and that right. does affect your self-esteem and it how does. you value and how you um how you kind of like present yourself to the world because you have it's hard to fight past all this noise and uh, i do want to say this i think that this is an example of again experience what i experienced and this is recently mm -hmm. um again my yoga experience <laughs> uh -huh. um but anyways i was at uh i do hot yoga uh -huh. so we were wrapping up a hot yoga um session and it was at a studio that i like right here in charlotte and i mean i was just like i was like i just need to go sit down and lay down and sleep because i'm exhausted mm -hmm. right but i don't really speak to anyone when i go there again i'm just like it's better if i don't because i don't know what the engagement is going to be like right so um i was getting my stuff ready i was wiping down my mat and this um woman that was next to me was a white woman she's like she's like oh i felt like the room was so uh, like it felt very like warmer than usual Mm -hmm. and i was like yeah it did and immediately i was like Where, what is this? is this gonna turn into like i don't know some question that's gonna make me no longer feel comfortable coming here like mm -hmm. my, her just saying is the room <laughs> warmer just because of past experiences right so i was like oh yeah it is and so she we continued to you know she's just like yeah but i really like it here i really sweat a lot and all this and so i was like you know true and but in my head i'm like is she gonna say something about my hair like can i touch your hair like your hair is so long right because you know obviously my hair is great like is this gonna turn into a hair conversation is this gonna right turn in, it, can i touch your hair so right afterwards i was talking to Dwayne. i was like you know what Dwayne? i could not even enjoy the conversation because mm -hmm. i had all of this noise in my head of like i hope this doesn't end up being something about race right and so i was the whole time she was talking i was just like mm -hmm, yeah and i was just like this has to like before it go, and it could not have very it could have just been literally an honest right. conversation right but because of the history and what i've experienced in other studios right like Dwayne has experienced when he's gone to yoga studios right the fence automatically goes up and it's hard right. to just enjoy a simple conversation right right and that and that, so from your example like it takes away from you being in that moment yeah. and i think you know i don't do yoga my daughter does yoga but i yeah. think with yoga yeah. it's how being in the moment being one okay. mm -hmm. you know and, and peace and because of um accumulative things that have occurred in your past is making you defensive with the present and i think when we look at psychological noise what we do and you all humans do this we put our experiences in categories mm -hmm. um and when we each time you experience some type of discrimination or some type of racist attitudes we put things in categories and when we're going into a situation we already got this category and we're like okay i have to be on point because you know do i have to let this person know look you know right. what i mean exactly but exactly you're thinking this in your head but you're not being in a moment and mm -hmm. to me it's almost like it's almost like stunning our emotional growth of living in the world mm -hmm. and why we didn't create it like why 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 can't we be who we are right. um and why can't you appreciate who i am or first mm -hmm. Why don't you learn who I am first? Mm -hmm. Learn me as a person, Chevelle. Learn you, Kai, yeah. um, before we let these biases and prejudice come in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another thing with what I want to emphasize with psychological noise, for example, you know, in the article I talk about walking into a yoga studio mm -hmm. and you know, you walking in, you smiling, you got your yoga mat, you ready, and people turn their heads and looking at yeah. you like you have three heads. Right. That's that, like that's not physical um discrimination mm -hmm. that's that 
that that racism, a lot of people look at racism as always, you know, verbal, um, is physical. No, mm -hmm. sometimes you can, f you feel it, you mm -hmm. see it mm -hmm. and you know what it is. Right. You know, um, I always tell people, have you ever felt tension in the room? You ever walk, mm -hmm. oh my God, did you feel the tension in the room? Mm -hmm. That energy. That's how it feels for us when we're not wanted mm -hmm. um, or you're, or they're questioning you like, why are you here? Right. And it's like, well, why are you here? Right. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. trying to enjoy something just like you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can, that a lot of times prevent people from participating in certain things. Mm -hmm. And again, that's taking away from your experience in the world and that, and which is not good, which mm -hmm. is not good. Right, right. And I, and so to like, you know, and I know that we're talking about like the yoga experience, but any mm -hmm. experience where you're in, uh, where you are not, uh, where it's more, um, you're like the only black person or something like the, a lot right. of times that's when a lot of that psychological noise can tend to start, um, or right. maybe driving back past the police officer, or anything right. where it's like a trigger for you. Um, right. The reason why I mentioned uh, yoga, not only that's the space where I am a lot of the times, but there's this perception that if you're a yoga teacher, that you're more enlightened, like, right? right. Like you, there's this space that you're, you're more enlightened person. If you're like in this, um, like the, uh, like yoga and meditation, like you don't mm -hmm. have these biases, right? Cause you mm -hmm. have now elevated because now you have this practice, you now meditate. And so for me, I think in the back of my head, I had like that thought like, hey, I'm going into like a yoga. So I should feel like different type of energy, right? Like when you said like you right. kind of feel that friction of I don't, you know, you're not wanted. So right. when you go into those spaces and you still feel it. It's like, whoa, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you, and there have been studios, especially, um, you know, when Dwayne, like now you see more men um going and practicing yoga and in classes and i think mm -hmm. that, that does help mm -hmm. um but when we're doing would go and you know he would he's like listen kai like i don't even look at people like like you know what like you can't even look at a person because you don't want any issue right so you're just walking into the studio i don't want to look at anybody i don't want anybody to think anything i just grab my stuff like this is supposed to be a community Right. Like you're supposed to go there and engage and share like, oh yeah, class was great. Oh yeah, I was able to release this. Not like I'm not right. going to look at nobody. And to to have like that type of stance, which you're doing that for your safety. You're doing that to make sure that you can enjoy your experience to the extent that you can. Um, right. Just all of that, like you said, like you're just kind of living in this world that you really can't enjoy everything that's in it. Right. And that's based on the experience that you've had over time right time and time again yeah. um and one of the things i was thinking about um you know writing the article and preparing for this is you know i haven't experienced every single thing that other people experience because all black people are different you know we all have different experiences and mm -hmm. and um and we all experience things to a different degree. But I can remember when I was a student at Le Moyne College, I was in my um, senior year and I wanted to do um, an internship at a mental health facility. So I had one of my friends who was working at one and she was like, oh, I'm going to tell the um, head of HR about you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, cool. So she told him, he was like, tell her to give me a call. So I talked to him. He was from Boston. He had his Boston accent. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I had just came back from a shopping trip in Boston with my aunt. So I was telling him different places that I went to visit. He was talking about the lobster. I'm like, I'm allergic to lobster. But anyways, <laughs> you know, it was a great over the phone interview. And then he said, I want you to come in um, so we can talk more. I'm like, great. So I go to the facility, I check in at the desk and say, you know, my name is Chevelle and I'm here to meet Bernie. And I sat down and then maybe a couple minutes later, a young white lady walked in, a young girl, she was probably my age. She was there to visit her mother. That was one of the patients. And then she sat across from me in a chair. So Bernie came out and he went over to the white girl and shook her hand and said, hi, Cheval, nice to meet you. Wow. She looked at him and said, that's not my name. So in my head, seriously? Yeah. So, you know, the here's the second, started. right here you go. <laughs> then I'm thinking I'm not going to get this job because he automatically thought that I was white based on our conversation. Mm -hmm. And then he turned over to me and he, with his eyes, did a double take. So I already knew. 
I, you know, and this, then it like, you're going to have to really perform, mm -hmm. you know, cause you want this job. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm like, hi Bernard, you know, this is, oh yeah, yeah. So I'm like, oh my God, like, how is this interview going to, I'm walking behind him, yeah. um, you know, thinking in my head, this interference that's really not preparing me for the interview. Like, how is he going to perceive me? He, he already obviously thought I was white right. because why did he go up to this young lady and said, hi, Chevelle? Right. Um, how is this going to affect me? Mm -hmm. And that's an experience I had like in my early 20s yeah. and not aging myself. I'm older than in 20s now, but <laughs> you know, like, so when I go to interviews, that's one of the things I think of, mm -hmm. you know, when I talk to people on the phone and then I'll go to meet them, that, that, that experience affects me and it doesn't allow me to be in a moment when I'm about to have a new experience because I'm so afraid that it's going to be a repeat right. and and that has happened it has happened yeah. <laughs> you know and and that's the thing that you know I wanted to talk you know just that just talk about it with people and say yeah I experienced this and and talk about ways of dealing with it like okay mm -hmm. this is what you experienced I don't want you to internalize that and start yeah you know having that anxiety that paranoia mm -hmm. um you know how do we deal with that you know i just wanted to start that conversation and i thought you know the article that i wrote can start the conversation and like i said next month i will put something out talking more of you know from those experiences what it can create for as mental health mm -hmm. And I think that's that's so key when you said to start having the conversation. And I think, unfortunately, um, and I'm going to do like a comparison to um, like the Jewish community, which I think is mm -hmm. great how they talk about the experience yes. of the Holocaust. Like mm -hmm. they are like, listen, this is what our community went through. We are making sure it never happens again. There will be a movie, multiple movies out. Um, a year that talks about what we endured, how we came through, how we build back our community, mm -hmm. how we build mm -hmm. back our families. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm not saying everybody uh, that has experienced Holocaust like just shares their story, because I'm sure there are some people that are like, it was so horrific, I, I can't even I, talk about it, right? Right. But there is this sense of like, um, there are certain people that listen, our, our, the next generation needs to know so they don't have to go through this. And right. unfortunately in our community, um, many of our elders, what they've experienced, the trauma of, I don't know, seeing someone in your family get lynched, reading about all the lynchings that used to occur, um, you know, black men and black women getting dragged out of their homes in the middle of the night, getting, um, you know, beat, tortured, killed by these, right. Um, right. vigilante groups that like, this is all stuff that we do not really talk about. Um, mm -hmm. and I know that we always, you know, we want to talk about, Oh, I got a little notification from Zoom. <laughs> I so, saw. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that we like to talk about like black girl magic and and black boy joy and all that stuff, which is mm -hmm. great. But right. we have to talk about the trauma that we experience and not just mm -hmm. kind of dwell on it and just get depressed about it because it can be depressing. It can like be. Like you said, if you just keep everything balled up and internalize it, that's just going to come out through, as we talked about, the maybe some type of um, the high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. heart disease like that stress is eventually gonna come out some kind of way Us right not talking right. about it doesn't mean that i've handled it right you know? and i tell you what i used to tell my patient if you don't deal with it it will deal with you yeah and and, and that's what we that's if you don't deal with that anxiety that mm -hmm. paranoia it will deal with you mm -hmm. um and that's it's not going to be a positive effect right you know? like, and so as you, I know you said in your next article, as we start to, to wind things down, since I got the notification, <laughs> so we don't just kind of click out as right. we, um, you said in the next article, you're going to go more into detail. I think you said about what to do. Um, right. Well, I'm going to, yeah, talk about more about the anxiety, being okay. scared, being, you know, dealing with the anger. Cause it can, you can, it can be very, become enraged when my husband yeah. was pulled out his car you know, pull out the car and right. thrown on, you know, on the car and fricks down and, he says, wear your seatbelt. Wait a minute, this is how you treat people? Yeah. You know, I was in rage and, you know, my husband telling me to shut up because I don't want anything to happen to you. But like how you feel 
you, you're not, you're, you're powerless. Or how do the man feel that he can't protect you? Like how right. did Dwayne feel during that time? He, if something occurred, he was he wouldn't be able to protect you. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about that, about putting balance in our life. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I love when you know other cultures talk about the things they've gone through. But one of the differences when we talk about it, you hear people, you need to get over it. Yeah. You know, slavery happened so many years ago, mm -hmm. but yet I can remember a story my grandmother told me about her brother being pinned to a cross and beaten in South Carolina because they thought he stole a pig, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, that was my grandmother's experience. I remember as a little kid, she was telling me this mm -hmm. and I'm in my forties and I can remember this and I visualize it even though I wasn't there, that, that, that affects you. Right. You know, and it saddens it saddens you because you're like, wow, think about what that young man experienced. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just think, you know, um, we we need to not only support one another and talk about it, talk about how our true feelings mm -hmm. about you, and how it affects our mental health, and then you know maybe down the line I could talk about how we can really make change and that's through social justice because you know racism you, we can't control people we can't change mm -hmm. people how they view us or how we see us mm -hmm. we can control how we see ourselves and how we view ourselves but also I think is importance of voting you know mm -hmm. so we can change some of these policies and I know I won't see it during my time to change but I do have faith that change will occur mm -hmm. um and that we won't continue to go through this because i'm quite sure when we think about slaves that were slaves working in the fields they never saw where we're at today they, right. that wasn't a part of their vision right you know? yeah. um so i do believe it is going to happen one day mm -hmm. but unfortunately i don't think it'll happen in my lifetime yeah i know and we were <laughs> talking about it was just like it feels like it's like this uphill climb and it's kind of yeah. like when do we reach the top of this hill yeah. um, because it's such a fight but like you said like our ancestors they didn't give up in yeah. the most horrific type of living situation if you i don't even know what call that living situation that they were in right so how can we give up and not make sure that we do whatever we can like you said especially to have that conversation because all that trauma that we went through mm -hmm. at no point was did a therapist like come into the community and say right. now how did you feel when right. your daughter and son just got sold and your husband just got beat to death in front of you like right no one there was never a point in time where there was this type of service that was for our community. It, we have right. been in survival mode since we yes. landed here in the United States. Yes, yes. And I think that's where the healing takes when we talk about it and talk about our feelings and, and have those, you know, um, sessions mm -hmm. of, of how do we move on? How do we heal? Mm -hmm. um, because right now to me, sometimes I feel like we're in a state of confusion. Yeah. We're running around, but we're not running towards each other. Right, right. Um, and, I, and I think, and I do believe, and I do see it just by you talking about heal, your the healing element mm -hmm. and, and yoga um, and, and different faucets of media that I see that people are talking about. I, I do have faith that um, this shall pass and one day someone will talk about, you know, remember, you know, I've read that we've dealt with, you know, our race dealt with this in society. Yeah. I do believe that one day um, it, it, it will get better. I agree with that too. And um, thanks so much, Chevelle. I think that's a, end, a perfect end to this like very heavy conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so if people want to learn more about you, um, can you want to give your website um, and how yes. they can reach out to you directly? Yes. Um, my website is addiction-prevention.org. Um, you can also call me at 919-352-9300. Um, I'm in the... Um, Raleigh Durham area and um, you, I do trainings on substance use on mental health I have a mental health first aid training coming up March 27th um, and that's on older adults later life issues where we do address um, cultural issues and mental health and how it affects older people mm -hmm. that's awesome so um, so yeah, so make sure you go to Chevelle's website and I will also put the link to her website um, in the description of this event. And I think everyone that joined us for, uh, for our session today, thank, a big thank you to Chevelle for writing this article, for uh, creating a space for us to have this conversation that we no longer have to internalize the psychological noise that goes on our head, but we can have create safe spaces for ourselves 
and start to dialogue and to begin the healing process. Um, so thank you. I uh, would love to have you back on a live and maybe the <laughs> next time, <laughs> next time I can figure out how to actually do a live on Facebook. <laughs> It was a learning experience, but we learned, yes. But thank you for everyone who joined on Zoom. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, I will have post the recording for this interview on the Facebook page so that you can look back over it and also get um, all the information I said that would be in the description box. And I hope you join me next time. Again, this is Kai Marie here from the Healing Element Podcast, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. And remember, healing is a journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.